Welcome. This is the diversity and inclusion in the age of COVID-19 brought to you by Energize Colorado, KPMG, and Technical Integrity. We'll do the legalese and then we'll jump in. The disclaimer, this webinar and the opinions provided within are for general information purposes only and do not constitute legal or professional advice. No user should act on the basis of any material contained in the webinar without obtaining proper legal or other professional advice specific to their situation. Please note that this webinar will be recorded for later use and made available for viewing on YouTube, Facebook, and EnergizeColorado.com. My name is Dave Mayer, founder and CEO of Technical Integrity, and I'll be your moderator today. And our partner from KPMG is the Director of Supplier Diversity, Susan Merkenbush. Hello, everyone. All right. We will get into uh, brief introductions after these slides, but we have uh, Ingrid Alonji, Xantha Thomason, and Aaron Clark, as well as our featured panelists. I'd love for each of the panelists briefly to introduce themselves, and why don't we start with Susan? Hi, everyone. I'm Susan Birkenbush. I'm the Director of Supplier Diversity at KPMG. I run our program that focuses on increasing our spend with businesses owned by members of the LGBTQ community, veterans, women, people of color, people with disabilities. Um, happy to be with you today. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about how KPMG is looking at supplier diversity in the new COVID reality. Awesome, thank you. Ingrid? Yeah, thanks, Dave. My name is Ingrid Alonji, and my background is in software development. I started a custom software development shop in 2010 called Quick Left in Boulder, Colorado, where I focused on diversity and engineering hiring. We were acquired by Cognizant in 2016, um, and I am also currently the chair of the board of Turing, which is a nonprofit computer programming school focused on training a diverse and inclusive student body. Uh, good morning. My name is Xantha Thomason. I had 27 years with IBM as resource strategy. Um, I was the youngest female executive for IBM. In my free time now, I'm volunteering for economic recovery for the state of Colorado. And hello, my name is Aaron Clark. My background also is in software development as a freelance developer. Um, last year, I founded uh, a small firm, which is just myself and, and a good team of um, pro bono assistants. Uh, called Equity Solutions, which is a vehicle to further the work I'm doing in diversity, equity, inclusion, um, and the intersection of criminal justice reform. Awesome. Thank you. And I suppose that leaves me. My name is Dave Mayer. I am the CEO of Technical Integrity. I'm a passionate community builder of many years. I've got 20 years of building executive and engineering teams with an emphasis on diversity and inclusion. Uh, we are a 50% women-owned small business, and uh, my wife and I vowed to help other small businesses run by uh, women and, and minorities to succeed, uh, certainly in general in Colorado, as well as in particular through the times of COVID. So as context for today's discussion, um, Energize Colorado, for those of you that are not familiar, uh, is an all-volunteer-led and run organization of several hundred volunteers that formed about three months ago at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, we have done uh, a ton to help Coloradans and um, you will find uh, an amazing array of resources uh, on energizedcolorado.com where this video will live in addition to Facebook and YouTube. Uh, today's goal is to help provide resources for small and mid-sized businesses specifically those run by minorities and women and veterans and others uh, highlighted by Susan at the top, as well as, of course, importantly, those that are embracing diversity and inclusion as an important way of getting through and even thriving during the pandemic. Uh, as my friend and colleague Katika Roy from Pipeline Equity said eloquently, organizations that put diversity, equity, and inclusion at the center of their crisis management efforts will come out ahead during COVID-19. 
and then similarly a fortune article very recently mentioned that diversity and inclusion is a potent source of strength for organizations as we weather these economic storms so with that let's dive in and i think i'd like to actually start with uh, the definition um, that a couple of us were talking about, a handful of us were talking about, is the definition and the difference between an underserved population and an underrepresented population. And Aaron, maybe you can jump in and, and Ingrid and whomever else would like to uh, help us define this term before we get into some of the resources. Sure, thank you, Dave. It, we were having a discussion about this session, sort of communicating amongst ourselves about what, uh, what areas our lives were, what, what areas of COVID in our lives have been impacted and how we wanted to represent the people you know, of Colorado that we are closest to. And, you know, the words that we use matter. And we were looking at some data that we'd received um, from various parties around uh, minority and small, uh, minority businesses and, and women businesses in the state. And the underrepresented versus underserved uh, conversation came up about which, which word or which we wanted to use. And, um, I reached out to Dr. Uh, Nina Mosby Tyler, who is a race and uh, equity expert here in Denver. Um, and she helped us out a little bit and explained that underrepresented um, is a term that is used often um, when a particular group of people has a lack of representation in a particular um, uh, voice. You know, for instance, if you don't have enough women on your board of directors, women are underrepresented and therefore it's really difficult to have um, equity you know, at the center and then underserved being the other word that's commonly used is when a group of people um, for whatever reason doesn't have the adequate or adequate resources to accomplish a task. This one is often seen in terms of money and resources. Um, and unfortunately, both minority uh, small businesses and women owned businesses um, just do not have the, the amount of resources that some other groups have. And so you know, we want to, in this session and other sessions, make sure that we lift up both uh, women-owned businesses and minority-owned businesses to balance out that representation and, um, you know, the resource allocations that we want to put in these areas. I think to add to that, too, is the point is that a lot of these small businesses are actually run by quite a few women and minority. Um, so the representation is, while it's high, um, there's just the lack of resources is um, more so in these cases. Well, thank you for that. Um, Xantha, why don't we come to you? We'd love to get an overview of what you've been working on specifically as a team lead with Energize Colorado uh, in this arena. And we'd love some, some highlights as well as uh, where folks can go to better understand uh, certainly where you are currently and where you're headed. Thanks, Dave. My name is Xantha and I've been working, I volunteered my time immediately when COVID-19 hit in. Um, I am an economist by trade and I'm retired from IBM. And I wanted to get involved because this is a big impact on our economy in Colorado. And I also have a lot of respect for our governor, Jared Polis, and he's doing a really good job from my perspective. So I jumped in right away. I was assigned the minority and women's small business. There's about 700 plus businesses across United, across Colorado for women and minority small businesses. And we started working with them immediately. We pulled 10%, started asking, instead of saying, okay, this is everything we can offer and this is everything we can give to you, we decided to take a step back, Eric Drummond and myself, and we went and started interviewing 10% of minority and women small businesses to say, what kind of help do you need right now? And really what came out of it is we need support from the state of Colorado, including grants. Um, no small business wants to take on more debt, so we're really working on the grant stream. Um, we're looking at smarter cities technology around, you know, how do you certify your business as clean for people to enter? Um, how do you do geofencing with uh, tracking? Um, so, and uh, working on a COVID kit on how do you open your business? And that includes like dry fog technology, lots of technology out there, and that's really beyond. Um, the other thing we're working on with state, state legislation is how do we, and this is going to hit home for a lot of small businesses, is in the state of Colorado, how do we really start moving merchant services fees to the customer? And 
If you're a small business and you're watching this, I know you have a big smile on your face right now. This is money in your pocket. So we are working on that and how we can drive change. So really those are the big hitters is really around grants, PPP, merchant services fees. Um, again, that's money in your pocket. And then we're looking at smarter city technology that's already there. There's a platform, it's already funded by the federal government. We're rolling it out in Denver. So really how do we start taking that technology and move it to small businesses? And that's really our focus this next week is the technology portion of it. So lots of work going on, Dave, and I appreciate the time and to be on this call. Yep, and specifically under the Get Help tab, there's financial support, business guidance, free professional services, mental health resources, videos and webinars where this will live, and then Get Questions Answered under Business Guidance is also where you can go. So thank you, Xantha, and we will continue on with our discussion. Um, Susan, would you bring us up to speed a little bit on some of your efforts, please, at KPMG for some of the folks that uh, fit the requirements for small and mid-sized businesses that are uh, women, minority, veteran, et cetera? Thanks, Dave. Uh, sure, during these times, um, it's important for us at KPMG in the supplier diversity and procurement area to remain focused on supporting are small and diverse businesses. And I kind of sit in the ideal spot. I've got the best of both worlds. I'm in the finance division in strategic sourcing and procurement. So I can, I, I'm in contact with the category managers who are actually doing purchasing. So we have a view into the pipeline, of what the firm is going to need. But I'm also very closely aligned with the uh, Chief Diversity Officers National Inclusion and Diversity Team. So we have a marketplace strategy that's focused on uh, what's going on during COVID, what the new reality will look like, and how we can help our suppliers and our employees, our workforce remain relevant um, post COVID uh, in our new reality. So some of the, the uh, things that we're doing um, are kind of shifting our focus to make sure that we include diverse suppliers in uh, purchasing. So before we had a program that um, there were guidelines, um, our category managers were told that they should look for diverse suppliers to include in, in purchases. And we've changed that. So now our policy is a little bit stronger and we are requiring that wherever there are diverse suppliers that meet um, certain business needs, they are included. Doesn't mean they'll win, but it means that they're invited and they'll be given uh, a fair shot at the business. Another thing that I've seen is a shift from uh, kind of just this focus on what are we buying and who are we buying it from to, and Xantha, you mentioned this, um, more mentoring. So outreach, how can we help? Um, we're a large firm. We've got lots of expertise in, uh, in lots of areas. And employees are starting to ask that question too, how can we help? How can we use our expertise to, um, to help small business owners who may be struggling at this point in time? So those are just a couple of uh, the initiatives that, that we're focusing on right now. Thank you for that. Are there, can you think of any um, perhaps, um, you know, common mistakes that, that people need to avoid or lessons learned that you may be able to, to help uh, folks understand how to be most efficient in the process of, of potentially working with KPMG? Sure. So obviously, um, agility is important. Um, we've um, seen some successes where our suppliers have um, kind of changed their business models and taken advantage of the opportunity. Some pretty obvious examples might be um, a couple of promotional item uh, vendors shifting to supplying PPE. So this means revisiting their supply chains, um, looking at what businesses, maybe schools are going to need in terms of reopening locations. Um, how can they get their hands on PPE and supply that. So that's one example. Uh, just, I would say generally being agile and being willing to, uh, to rethink your business model and uh, not being kind of paralyzed or let's wait and see what happens or you know maybe this will blow over in a couple of months and I can quickly recover. Um, I think that is, is probably unwise. Um, 
So uh, new products, new services, um, looking at kind of selling safety as uh, and health as opposed to products uh, would be uh, another suggestion. So I think just the the um, the willingness to um, to rethink and be innovative. Um, most entrepreneurs are very innovative, creative people, right? So um, to the extent that you're able to uh, to reassess the situation and adapt, um, it, it can only be to your advantage. And as far as doing business with a large um, firm or corporation such as ours, um, we and many of our clients are looking for certified suppliers. So um, I can share information with you about the organizations that certify um, various types of businesses owned by underrepresented groups. Um, there are usually membership fees associated with them, but now there are lots of um, free resources that they're offering as well. Uh, so they might be uh, worth checking out. And I can share those resources uh, with you um, for posting at the end of the presentation, if you like. Awesome, that'd be great. And uh, we will definitely include that uh, certainly uh, in the comments below, as well as on the resource slide uh, at the end. And then finally, we'll, we'll ask our audience here, anybody watching uh, in the future, please let us know if there are issues that we did not tackle. Uh, things that you would like to see tackled on future webinars, uh, both from uh, you know from KPMG's perspective, from small and mid-sized business perspective, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we want to make sure that everybody's needs are being met. So uh, Ingrid, how about we jump in um, from your perspective? I think you have a couple different interesting per perspectives to bring to the table. Certainly, as a long-time technologist, as a long-time entrepreneur. Um, why don't you talk about sort of your recent situations of, of working from home uh, as a mom, working with, with child care, as well as uh, a potential shift in your career and how that's been uh, presented some new challenges and how you've overcome those challenges. Yeah, thanks. Um, you know, it's it's there's a little bit of that imposter syndrome as it is if you're working as a woman in tech and you want to make sure that you're prepared in meetings. And so when all of the COVID stuff hit and we started working from home, then you know, you're know you sort of tasked with balancing, trying to be professional on the screen and having your whole family in the room with you. Um, I have four and a half year old twins and so they are not really self-directed with kind of school lessons and activities on TV. So um, it was pretty challenging and, and really exhausting. And I, I have a, I'm in a co-parenting situation. So what I ended up doing was um, rescheduling all of my meetings as much as I could to the days that I didn't have my kids. And that way I could really focus um, and, and try to like put in what I felt like my best quality of work that I could. And then on the other days, I was able to take, you know, take a few calls here and there, but then just um, really pay attention to my kids and engage with them. And I, it's been kind of a blessing in disguise, you know, to be able to connect with them um, at this age. Um, but also, it's I've had to just let things go. And so I felt like I had kind of gotten the hang of this, and we were getting into a rhythm, and everything was great. And then I was um, told that my position was being eliminated. Um, as I mentioned in the intro, my software company that I built in 2010 was acquired by Cognizant in 2016, and they were really hit hard by some of the COVID stuff and a ransomware attack. So we, um, so I was sort of thrown back into um, the situation where I had to take calls with potential uh, new employers whenever it was more convenient for them. And that was really challenging. I had one call with a, a young VC who um, didn't have kids yet. And um, luckily, there's a mute button. But in the background, one of my daughters was yelling at me pretty loudly. And I don't know if I was smiling or cringing. Um, but I really it was really hard. I felt like, man, I, this interview, I'm bombing it. This guy's never going to want to hire me. I look like a hot mess. Um, but then I tried to like, give myself a break and say, okay, actually, maybe this is a good thing. Maybe he'll see that I really can handle stress really well. So I think the point I am trying to make is just how hard all of these changes are on all of us. And 
and that they're exhausting and that we're going to feel tired and and um, and this and these are kind of normal feelings um, even though if you're just not used to that it's just um, an adjustment to be like why am I so tired is staring at a video screen all day making me tired it's just a, incorporating change is, is is taxing so I just want people to know that they should just you know be kind to themselves as they go through this yeah, I appreciate you being so genuine and authentic and, and vulnerable. It's it's obviously difficult times for everybody, but I feel like, um, especially in dealing with um, upper management or p potential employers, that it's important just to be open and honest, right? You know, just what precisely what you just did was just say, look, you know, this is kind of the reality of the situation. I'm sorry, I've got my daughters running around in the background, but guess what? You know that's that's sort of everybody's new reality and and i don't think anybody is going to be surprised by that anymore and obviously there's some funny stories of naked children running around in the back of the zoom call uh, you know and and it's sort of <laughs> it's the norm these days um my question is perhaps around lessons learned for you um and other perhaps strategies um either on the job hunt or on um, even, you know, obviously you've been hiring diverse workforces for a long time. We did a diversity inclusion webinar uh, way back when for Denver Startup Week. Um, and then maybe we can jump in briefly on sort of the reskilling and upskilling work you're doing with uh, with Turing as well. Yeah, I think um, I think that, you know, it's kind of said a little bit earlier in in the panel here, um, just by Susan, by just it's not a time to be you're you're kind of in shock and it's it's hard to reorient on sort of what to do next and i think it can be overwhelming i mean a, a large portion of my team um also got shifted around and i think people were kind of paralyzed by oh i don't have a resume or i don't have a portfolio yet i can't apply for this job until i have these things done and it sort of became like too overwhelming and then no action was happening. And I think what I try to do for myself and encourage and others is just take little steps. So we organized um, something you can do with amongst friends, a resume review session on Zoom where we looked through and then people had all these ideas and then all of a sudden we found templates and then we looked at examples and then all of a sudden by the end of the hour we had we had something to go with, some resumes. And so stuff like that, and then just encouraging you to just reach out to your network. Um, people wanna help, your friends wanna help. So whether it's LinkedIn or Facebook, um, I think there is a little bit of embarrassment when you're like, oh, I was laid off. Um, and I certainly uh, felt that as well. Like, why did they pick me? And it's just, these are hard decisions and hard times. Uh, or why did my business fail? Like, there's just a lot of that. So just know that your community is out there and that there's a lot of people that that really want to help, um, you know, sort of related to this um, with my work with Turing, we've seen really an increase in enrollment. So we have a, a seven week uh, computer programming school. It's uh, it was, you know, in person in downtown Denver. Now it's uh, been moved to online for now. Um, and we do focus on a diverse student body and we've kind of been noticing an increase in people taking this opportunity to reskill and get into a career in, in technology, which has been a bit more resilient than sort of other things. And so one of the things that we're putting together with some of the grant money for the workforce initiatives because of COVID is a three month full time paid fellowship for graduates so that they can get real work experience, but it also gives businesses a chance to take on talent when they themselves might be feeling cash crunch and uh, cash issues. So we're hoping that this kind of program grows and we can get, we can sort of rebuild, you know, the engineering community in a more diverse way. Um, and this is a really great opportunity for us to be able to do that. Awesome, yep, the the work that uh, Jeff Casimir and you are doing at uh, Turing are, is uh, got a strong track record. And um, so thank you for all your hard work. Um, it's actually a good transition uh, to you, Erin. Um, will you tell us a little bit about what you've been working on? Um, and uh, and in particular, maybe you can start with some of your thoughts around um, why you believe it's important to get a sense for exactly how many 
small and mid-sized businesses are run by minorities, women, veterans, et cetera, uh, in Colorado specifically? Yeah, thank you, Dave. Um, I think it's very important for during a time like this, um, you know, as, as Anthem mentioned earlier, you know, when they did their first round of studies, everyone was just, you know, reacting and there was a lot of chaos. And so now that we're um, a few months, unfortunately, into this pandemic, um, to some extent, the dust has settled and we're looking at how we can uh, survive, but then also thrive on the other side of this. Um, and what we're trying to figure out, especially in the state of Colorado, is, you know, with those 700 businesses that are women or minor, minority owned, you know, what the real landscape looks like of those businesses. And a lot of times, if we don't drill down at some of the data um, that's backing up, you know, these numbers, it, it's really difficult to provide adequate resources. And in the case, you know, that I'll make in a second with minority businesses to try and cut away some of the red tape. Um, and so Rob Smith, the um, director of the Rocky Mountain Finance Institute, Microfinance Institute, um, gave us a presentation earlier this week. And in it, he gave some really um, impactful and stark data that I think it's important for us to, to realize. And, and two of the numbers um, stood out to me. And the first one is that of all the small businesses in here in Colorado, 40% um, of those are, are women owned. Um, and we've got about 49% of the population that's, that are women here in the state. But 88% of those businesses have revenues of less than 100,000. Um, and, and, and that is very difficult for these business owners to run their business and also take care of their finances, all of the fees and expenses that Xantha was mentioning, as well as provide a profit for their employees. And so that number is, is really stark, you know, and then one in, one in three of those are, are mothers. Um, and as Ingrid mentioned, it's just very difficult to, to manage your career while managing children. I have children as well, and I know it's very difficult. And the other fact um, that he brought up is uh, the minority owned. And 15% of the businesses here in Colorado, small businesses, um, are minority owned to 35% of the population being minorities. And so that is a bigger uh, gap. And 14% of the black owned businesses, 14% of those are black owned businesses. But the revenue for the black owned businesses is only $58,000. And so if you look at you know, just take a look at your own personal finances right now during COVID and, and how things are impacted. If you take away, you know, your revenue all of a sudden, you know, some of us can afford to live longer, but some of us are impacted, you know, quicker. Um, the uh, NAACP just put out a study with a bunch of uh, minority financial groups, and they said 58% of Black and Latino households in America don't have enough money to cover three months of expenses without income. That includes all their rent, their food, they're done. And so now that layoffs have disproportionately affected, you know, black and brown folks here in the country and, and in Colorado as well, um, some of those folks are literally out of money right now and don't have a lot um, to, 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 to lean on. And so what we're trying to do is look at, you know, resources that we can put into these businesses to make sure that not only can they survive COVID, but as Ingrid was mentioning, how can we look towards reskilling and other efforts down the road so we can come out of this. Um, the Brookings Institute did a study that said that um, if the Great Recession were to hit, and we're already looking at numbers right now that look like it could be worse than the Great Recession across the nation, most Black-owned businesses are not going to not going to survive, and that's really really a drastic, you know, thing to to experience. Will you talk about some of the the upskilling and reskilling work that you're hoping to be working on uh, soon, and you've you've been working towards, Aaron? Please. Yes, um, I'm a supporter in any way possible of things that uh, Ingrid is doing at Turing. Um, I'm an, I'm in a number of developer communities, and I know a lot of the uh, more inclusive coding programs are are doing exactly what Turing is doing. Um, but as Dave mentioned here in, in Colorado, Turing, Turing stands out, um, uh, you know, head and shoulders above many because Turing looks down the road towards reskilling. So I'm supporting Turing and any other programs that I can that will, you know, help our, our folks reskill in, in tech. Um, but one of the areas that I'm passionate about is criminal justice reform. And here in the state of Colorado, um, we're fortunate to have uh, a Department of Corrections director uh, and Dean Williams, and also uh, Governor Jerry Polis, who are interested in making sure that our state is um, is reformed in a way that looks at public safety as the foundation. And so, 
Um, both of those gentlemen are doing a tremendous job at putting programs forth that are helping um, are currently incarcerated and are formerly incarcerated. But some of the some of the issues we have in, in America is you know we've got five million people that are formerly incarcerated, and pre COVID, twenty seven percent of those folks are unemployed. Those are great recession numbers of unemployment, and that's pre pre COVID. And so we're really worried those that are in the justice reform uh, space that post COVID we're going to have those numbers you know drastically increase because. Um, you know, we're looking at worse, uh, uh, you know, worse population coming home from prison. We have about 600,000 people that transition from prison every year. Now, as many of us say, when most folks come home from jail and prison, they've got to work. And if they don't work, you know, they have to take from the system and the system's already uh, really trying to help everyone. So reskilling becomes a really, really important concept um, here, especially in the state of Colorado. And so we're working on two things uh, to possibly help this population. The first is uh, we're putting the final touches to a program that will start in July that will take 20 people that are formerly incarcerated uh, working with the Second Chance Center uh, run by Hassan Latif, who is really well known in the community um, in Aurora. And those folks will learn how to code in a program completely online. Um, we'll give them technical training and then try to get them into an apprenticeship type program here in the state of Colorado. And so we're looking to build that out. Um, a couple of good foundations have funded that. The students will get a small living stipend, a laptop, um, and then training all online until we can come out of COVID. And the other thing is we're looking at how do we scale that to do more reskilling for folks. Um, again, normally when someone comes out of jail and prison, the cities and states that they work with, give them a contract, maybe working in landscaping, working in manufacturing, but the concern is that those jobs are going to be gone, budgets are going to be cut, or they're going to be taken by uh, current you know, people that are in our communities that need those jobs as well. And so we're really concerned that a year down the road, uh, we need to make sure that our formerly incarcerated have skills in the technical industry. Yeah, pretty amazing work. So thank you for all your efforts there. Um, and I'll continue briefly with you, Aaron, specifically around resources that you're aware of uh, in Colorado um, for small and mid-sized minority-owned businesses. And then I'll uh, ask the same question of Susan. I will say, by and large, we're a tad bit behind in aggregating those resources um, specifically for minority businesses. We're doing a little bit better with women-owned businesses. So first and foremost, Interdress Colorado is trying to be um, that point where people can go to and find resources throughout the state and throughout the nation um, to help out. Um, but what's really happening right now is, is the activists in our, in our state and in, um, uh, in our nation are speaking up. Uh, Mark Cuban, for one, just tweeted a couple days ago that he's really trying to help people that uh, are women and minority business owners that did not get a PPP loan or they're just kind of waiting. Um, he's tried to step in and help them. Um, the rapper T.I. from Atlanta did a call two days ago uh, with Ashley Bell, who is with the SBA um, for the southern states. And I think around 109,000 black and brown small business owners and entrepreneurs are on that call to try and get assistance. Um, the NAACP has a list of resources. Um, there's a number of other institutions like Verizon Foundation has one. Um, Essence Foundation has a bunch of resources. And so what we're going to do is we're going to try and take some of those, um, give those to Xantha and the, and the team, and hopefully post those on the site so that all of our businesses here in the state that are impacted can reach out. Um, and I do want to give one quick shout out again to what Xantha mentioned uh, in terms of those mentors. That's a huge huge um, lift that uh, Xantha and the team of uh, the mentor team have created because a number of the businesses that I've talked to that didn't get their loans, didn't get the PPP protection, it's because they couldn't figure out the red tape. They couldn't figure out how to contact their bank or maybe they didn't get a call back or they just were waiting. Um, and the ones that seemed to get the loans were the ones that were able to access those mentors or those resources or how to get attorney. And so I would definitely go to the Energized Colorado website um, for some of those resources. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll, I'll just tag on to that, that uh, again, those links are live currently with regards to financial uh, advising, financial modeling, legal help, um, access to grants, et cetera, beyond the PPP. Uh, and then uh, obviously we'll have this resource slide 
uh, at the end of this presentation, and we'll make sure that Xantha and the team have uh, much of what uh, Aaron just mentioned. Um, and so, Susan, um, I'd love to hear from you with regards to uh, your thoughts on resources through KPMG or otherwise uh, that are available uh, from your, your side of the house. Thank you, Dave. Um, so I, I mentioned that larger corporations and firms such as KPMG um, mostly look to do business with certified suppliers. So those would be validated um, businesses, diverse businesses owned um, and operated by members of underrepresented groups. So the certifying organizations um, in Colorado that and now normally there is a fee associated with belonging to them um, and becoming certified. They do have uh, lots of free information and resources um, at this point that may be useful. So uh, for example, the for women owned businesses, the Women's Business Enterprise Council West. Um, and I can I can give you the website uh, for that to post at the end. Great. Um, and the Colorado LGBTQ Chamber of Commerce and the Mountain Plains Minority Supplier Development Council. So those organizations, again, certify businesses, but have lots of information available uh, that anyone can access at this point. Awesome, thank you. I think, um... You know, it's always a hazard when you have such a large group of amazing people. Um, but I think what I'd like to do is have everybody um, give some concluding statements around best practices, resources, things we've not covered uh, that will most benefit small and mid-sized businesses uh, run by minorities, uh, women, uh, veterans, etc. Uh, and um, let's make sure that uh, we will include all of those resources on the slide at the end and in the links below. Um, so maybe we can start with you, Xantha. Yeah, thanks, Dave. Um, I think Ingrid pushed on this, but let's, um, I recommend everyone just keep breathing. Uh, we're gonna get through this, right? Be kind to yourself. Um, every single sensor is being hit right now. We don't know what's going on. We don't know when this is gonna end. We don't know where the right data is. So just keep breathing. Uh, routine is so important. Try to keep to some kind of routine. Um, for me, I would definitely encourage everybody who's watching this to just pull up Energize Colorado. There is a ton of data out there, and this is Coloradians helping Coloradians. We're not, everyone is volunteer on this work stream. Uh, there's entrepreneurs, there are CEOs, there are executives. We have technical people. We have a ton of people throwing their names in the hat to help as well. So if you need help, go out there, go through the website, get a mentor, volunteer. We need more volunteers. So if you have some time, get out there and volunteer. So um, Energize Colorado, it's we are here for you and just keep breathing. We are going to get through this. Beautifully said. Ingrid? Yeah, so of course, uh, Turing.io is where you can find out more about the program if you want to reskill. And then Turing Plus is the uh, paid internship program that we're running. Um, and again, the money comes from not from the businesses, but from us and the grants. Um, so if you're a business that wants to get involved with that, you can find out more. And I think, uh, like Xantha said, just I was going to say, just um, keep to a routine. So one thing I organized with my coworkers was a social check-in at 10 a.m. every morning, and I broke the group up into groups, and whoever can come can come, and we just chit-chat for 30 minutes, but it's at the same time every day. So figure out some ways you can connect with your community or other business owners that are going through the same things, um, and just to have something kind of on your schedule that can help you stay grounded and connected. Um, we share a lot of ideas. Um, we help each other with, like I said, resumes and things. So um, just reach out to your community. Aaron. Thank you, Dave. I have to uh, second what was said by Xantha and Ingrid. Um, you know, we need to move into a graceful time. Give everybody some space, give everyone grace and reach out for help. 
um, on the Energize Colorado site and on the social channels, you'll see a webinar that Dave actually led on mental health. Um, as women and minority business owners, sometimes we we forget to take care of ourselves. You know, we don't ask for help um, in the very core issues that we need. And right now, um, our mental health is really, really important. So please reach out, ask for help. Um, ask your friends, ask Energize Colorado. Um, there are free resources for um, for therapy and for counseling. And this is a time that uh, we can't be too uh, proud to ask for that. This is a time that, you know, like Xantha said, we're Coloradans trying to help Coloradans. And if you need the help, the help is there. Um, and, and reach out and, and, and let us let us help you out if you need. Susan, you want to bring us home? Sure, thank you. Um, so I just wanted to go back to something that Ingrid said uh, a minute ago, and I think everyone's kind of hinted at, is remembering that inclusion and diversity in the workplace includes bringing your whole self to work, your whole experience to work, and being genuine and being comfortable being authentic, right? And so when your kids are running around or yelling at you and you're trying to decide on the spot, uh, should I hide this? Should I embrace it? here it is, here's who I am, right? I think we're all going through that right now um, with our dogs barking and the, and the kids running around. And it, it, that makes this a shared experience as well. So um, as a woman in business for a, a few years, I understand that I have grown children and kind of had to make those decisions all the time about what do I hide and what do I bring with me to work, um, but I think um, just in, in you know kind of going along with the theme of self care and wellness and taking care of each other, let's let's give ourselves a break and let's give each other a break. Um, this is a, a real situation, right, that we're dealing with. So um, just again um, from the business perspective, being able to be agile, rethinking what you're doing, what what's your business proposition, um, and and how can you use your business skills to kind of re, um, rethink your value proposition and, and offer something to your clients and potential clients that, that they may not even know they need. So um, thank you. I appreciate this opportunity. This has been a, a, a great group. Well, thank you all. Uh, I think uh, grace and authenticity and we're all in this together really summarizes uh, today's chat, obviously, aside from uh, all the resources that are available at energizecolorado.com. Uh, we're grateful for you. We're here for you. Uh, if anybody needs assistance, I'm happy to just have an offline conversation as well at dave at technicalintegrity.com. And we'll include all of the uh, resources mentioned in the links below. Thanks for being here and hang in there.